Hello, uh, my name is Ray Hughes. I'm an interviewer with the American Veterans History Project conducted by the Cincinnati Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today we have the distinct honor and privilege to interview Mr. Herbert Heilbrunn of Cincinnati, Ohio, a pilot during World War II. Uh, and do uh, you mind if I call you Herb? I hope you do. Uh, Herb, uh, we'll start the interview out with your uh, background of your family, uh, where you were born and when you were born and your family history. Mm -hmm. Well, I was born in 1920, and uh, God willing, I'll be uh, 90, 94 years old next month. What day? Uh, October the 11th. And uh, born in Cincinnati, went to school in Cincinnati, uh, short term at Ohio State, and uh, didn't care for, for that, got into business and I was a real estate uh, broker for over 50 years. And uh, I'm certainly grateful to, to be able here to talk about it after 261 hours of combat and 35 missions. It got kinda, kinda hairy at times, but uh, here we are. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy to talk with you gentlemen and pleased that this will go into the archives. Well, we're certainly happy to be here. Herb, tell me about your family, your father and mother, their mm. names and uh, background. Yeah. My dad was Herbert uh, L. Heilbrunn. My mother uh, was Mary Louise, called Mary Lou, and they were both uh, born in Cincinnati. And uh, were good, wonderful parents. Uh, my dad uh, was excited about my, my uh, work in, uh, in the service during the war. In fact, he pinned on these silver wings himself. He came out to New Mexico and it says uh, my name on it and, and uh, God bless you, her. And uh, my dad signed these wings, so they're priceless. And uh, I had a good life, I must say. And uh, not a lot of education. Uh, uh, went to one year at, at college at Ohio State and I uh, got an A in English and played on the first polo team and that's all, that's about, that was about it. But uh, I learned later in life and uh, had a good real estate uh, uh, life. Uh, as I said, over 50 years, president of the real estate board and all that good stuff. And, uh, and now what I do is give talks around the country and did many of them with my dear friend John Lear and he doesn't do it anymore but I, speak for him about certain things that some of them aren't very nice what happened to him but uh, having him for a friend is uh, is just beyond words uh, he uh, when I grew up we didn't we didn't have black friends that's the way life was I never heard a, a, a wrong remark in my home in my life about anybody but they lived one place and we lived another and uh, to have found him uh, not too many years ago, I think it was 16 years ago, that they were honoring the local Tuskegee Airmen at a reception downtown. I didn't know there was such a thing in town. I thought, I wonder if I could find a fellow that flew when I did, but I thought, Saturday is crowded, I'm not gonna be able to do it, but you know, the Lord seems to guide me all the time in the right places, and I went down there, and I talked to a fellow, and I said, uh, I, I flew B-17s out of the 15th Air Force in Italy. And I said, I was escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen. I said, is there any chance that, I'm sure nobody's here, but do you know where, where I could find a Tuskegee Airman? He said, you see that fellow over there talking to those other two fellows? He said, his name's John Lear. He's an original Tuskegee Airman, and he's my father. Well, I went over there and I gave him a hug. <laughs> and he, he told people later, he thought, maybe this fellow is trying to sell me some real estate or, or, <laughs> or, or, or something. And, and I said, you know, I've been waiting 51 years to, to give you a hug and thank you for keeping a Fock Wilson and Messerschmitts off my rear end. Well, one thing leads to another, and we got out our mission sheets, his and mine. And I, on, on three missions, I had the 35, I've written every one of them down. Uh, the, the, the Tuskegee Airmen, were, they, they were called red tails. They painted their tails red. And three of those missions were Red Tails. And if we got out his mission sheet, would you believe that he was on three of those missions? He could have been from here to the wall with me. And one thing led to another, and that's when he said he went to a little school in Avondale. He said it was the old Workham Estate. 
beautiful old home, and it was turned into five grades. And he said, uh, I happen to have been there in the third grade. I said, John, <laughs> I lived on Warwick Avenue, and I walked up the street, and I was in that school in the third grade. <laughs> now, I save everything. You can ask my wife. I save everything. It's not always good, but I save it all. And I rooted around. I knew there was a picture someplace of Miss Pitchell's class. I rooted around and rooted around. And what did I come up with with a picture of Miss Pitchell's 1927 uh, class? Got the picture here. There were uh, 41 kids in the class. There was one black boy. I'm standing next to him, cheek to cheek. Now I think that was, we think that was destiny. You know, to be in the same school would be remarkable. To be in the same school would be remarkable, but to stand next to the only black boy and we've become great friends. We've given talks. Uh, I think I stopped at about 80 talks around the country, uh, eight or nine uh, uh, different countries, and uh, it's just been it's just been heartwarming to to have him as a friend and to find out what he happened, what happened to him. And uh, not too many years ago, he he was going down to some place down south. And he was, uh, he was a couple, he and a couple other uh, Tuskegee's were stopped by a man. And he said, I, I, I don't know if I should use the word or not. Uh, John's given me like right to say the words the same way he does. And if you'd like me to say that, I will. If not, I'll just stop it. But they called him a terrible word. And uh, he said, officer, that's not what we are. He said, we're, we're uh, pilots in the United States Army Air Corps. And this fellow pulled out a, a gun and cocked it and put it to his head and said one more word and I'll blow your brains out. That was one thing Johnny told me. Another time after that, three of, three of uh, two of Johnny's friends and Johnny came in town uh, for a, they were gonna have some minor surgery and the bus was stopped. And this fellow gets on the bus and John said, when I took a look at him, I knew it was bad news. He was mean, he was nasty, and he looked around and he said, you know, I've killed a lot of, a, a lot of, so, so many, you know, use, think of the word, you can think about it, but I've never killed one with silver wings and silver bars and tonight's the night. And he said he got Johnny and his friends out of the bus and started cuffing them around and a police car pulled up with white policemen. And he said, uh, what are you guys doing? He said, we're killing these so-and-sos. And they got in the bus and left. And Johnny said, I'm gonna die on the streets of Memphis. And a sailor came by with his little boy and a wife and said, what are you guys doing? We kill, we're killing these so-and-sos. And he said, what'd they do? Nothing to you, nothing, we just don't like them. This fellow said, you know, maybe I don't like them either, but by God, you're not gonna kill them. And they put him on the bus and Johnny went back to, to the base here and he, he called up his base and said, you send a B-25 down, I'm leaving this place for good. But you know, he said to me, he said, Herb, I, I won't forget what happened to me, but I cannot live with hate. He said, I won't do that because it'll chew you up. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, I guess, the end of this story is a couple years ago, there was a little airfield out here and uh, uh, we, we sold our books and a plane pulled, o pulled over and a fellow bailed out with a with a chute that you, you know, never saw anything that big, and they folded into a into a canvas bag, and they bagpiped it up to the reviewing stand where John and I and a gentleman uh, whose son was captured in in uh, Afghanistan and uh, never came home, but unfortunately it was in a box. And as we left that day, and we walked to get our cars, it was a hot day. It was an emotional day. And Johnny stopped with me and he looked at me and he put his hand, he said, Herb, now remember this is a black man saying this to a white man who was almost lynched at least two times that I know. And you know what he said to me? Mm. He said, I love you, Herb. Can you imagine that? And I said, I love you too, Johnny. And the friendship is just, just hard, hard to believe. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a ring at the bell and his son was standing there, and I, I thought, I don't want to hear anything. He said, there's a fella out here in the convertible wants to see you. And Johnny had, it was a beautiful, I think, a 1968, it was like brand new. Right. 
And I, he didn't get out of the car, but I rustled his hair and pushed him in, you know, and, and uh, we just had a, had a great day, had a great day. And uh, if I got time for one other thing, yeah, he's, I mean, he's so, he's serious about, about what happens in, in life and flying, and he, and, and he can also make me laugh. And, and the one other thing, he, he said, we talked at the uh, university across the river uh, they had 300 kids in the class. This has been a couple of months ago, a couple, maybe a couple of years ago, and they like to ask questions. And after we finished, a, one kid popped up and he said, "I have a question for Mr. Lear." And he said, "Mr. said you go ahead and ask your question." He said, "You know, you and Mr. Heilburn have a wonderful story. Somebody ought to make a movie out of you two guys." And John said, "Well, there's been little talk, but nothing really yet." And he said, "Besides that, they'd have a trouble. They'd have trouble with a movie with us." And the kid said, what would that be? And Johnny said, they'd never find anybody good looking enough to play me. Well, <laughs> and they, they laughed pretty good and Johnny laughed <laughs> and he was sitting next to me and I went like this to him and I said, that was funny. And he said, I don't think it's funny. I meant every word of it. <laughs> so he can bring tears to my eyes or he can make me laugh. And he's, uh, he's a wonderful human being and I'm, I'm blessed, to, blessed to say he's a friend of mine. Yeah. John flew over 50 missions too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and was wasn't treated very well. Uh, wasn't treated very well. I wouldn't be here today, really. There's a good chance I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be making this conversation if those guys didn't keep the Fock Wilson and the Messerschmitts away from me. Mm -hmm. That was their job, you know. That was his job. He could have been one of those that flew from here to the wall with me. I don't know. He don't yeah. know. But uh, they did a good job, and they didn't get a lot of thanks for it. Uh, now Herb, uh, you were a pilot, is that correct? Correct. Um, tell us uh, about the plane you flew and the crew yeah. and well, the missions you were on, yeah. if you would. Well, you, you, you know, when you ask me to do that, that's something I love to talk to you about. A B-17 Flying Fortress uh, weighed 68,000 pounds. It had uh, 1350 mach caliber machine guns, and it had a crew of, uh, of 10, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, and a ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, a tail gunner, if that's, I think I've got them all. And, top turret uh, gunner? And top turret gunner. He was also the engineer. And it was a fantastic airplane. Uh, the uh, things that they could take, uh, I could I'll only tell you two of them, uh, that uh, we hit an oil refinery southwest of Berlin Christmas Day and they had 650 flat guns over that target. Where at? And it was called uh, Brooks, Brooks, Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, we had uh, uh, 89 holes in the airplane. My engineer pulled out the flak and, uh, you know. Another time I lost two engines and this was an airplane that uh, came down from the, uh, wondered how it came down from England, I don't know, but it did. And it was an old B-17, it was painted. And uh, I didn't like when I read the Form 1, it, it had no, no repairs done on it at all. And I was a lucky guy. I had one engine quit before we got to the target. Number, number two started to, to vibrate and, and smoke and I, I had to feather it. And uh, I didn't want to go over the target and lose another one, so you can abort. I don't like to do that. I didn't think I'd get credit for it. I did, finally. And uh, about 45 minutes later, uh, the same thing happened with number one. Uh, it started to vibrate and smoke, and I, so I feathered that. Now, I got two of them feathers, and I'm a long way from home. And I couldn't get any fighter escort. The radios didn't work. And uh, so we, we salvoed our bombs. We threw out the our flak suits, we threw out our helmets, we threw out at least two, two machine guns, anything to lighten the airplane. And uh, we're, we're going over the Dolomites and uh, I'm keeping, you know, <laughs> it's kind of touchy. And I see out uh, of number two, which is right next to my window, they had a little pipe at the top of the, uh, the cell. And I think what it was was to keep some of the heat out for the engine when it, and, and I looked out there and I saw oil squirting out of that one. Now if that one goes, um, we're done because you can't bail out over the Dolomites. They see if they found what was left of fellas that 
bailed out and hitting those rocks coming down and it, you know, it'd kill you. And you can't land there. So I said a three word prayer. I said, God, just, I said, just get me, get me over the, get me over the Po Valley. Because the Dolomites and the Po Valley and then the Adriatic and we go down the Adriatic to the spur of Italy and that's where our, our base was. So uh, I just kept my fingers crossed and we got, we got over the, got over the Dolomites and and then I, I made another little deal with the Lord. I didn't say get me home. I said just get me halfway down the Adriatic because the British had launches and they when they see a 17 in the water, I've seen three of them in the water, they'd come out and pick you up. Well, we got halfway down and uh, I said we're going home. So uh, needless to say, we got home. I was tired, the crew was happy and, and uh, there's another story that I really don't think I can repeat because uh, it, it, it had something to do with the, uh, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit. Uh, an engineering officer came down, it was a major, I was the first lieutenant. He looked around and said, good job, lieutenant, you'll probably get a DFC for this. And the rest of the story I can tell you, but I don't think it should be on, on tape, but I, I got in his nose and I, I told him a few things. and. And he turned around and walked away and I got my DFC. But uh, it was just a great airplane. And when I get to fly it here, I, uh, Lunkin could come, could come in with Lunkin every year. It was here last week. And uh, I've got, there was a picture of me in the paper. I don't know if you saw that, uh, next to the airplane. And, mm -hmm. and I fly in the cockpit and they wanted me to, uh, I can't fly the airplane when it's here for regulations for taking up people, but when it leaves here, I can do anything I want to do. And in fact, that, uh, last year they let me fly it to fly it to Lexington with my son in the cockpit and his arm around me. See, and they wanted me to go again this time. And and I sell these books. Uh, you know about the books. And right. I got Wednesday. We got uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Thursday was media, and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And Sunday. We, we had breakfast at 10.30 and I got, I got to the, the place at 10.30 and we, I sold 98 books and I didn't have anything to eat all day long. They had some hot dogs I didn't like, but I had water. And uh, you know, that means I talked to 98 people and write something in their book and there was another 98 I talked to that didn't buy the book, which is all right. But uh, it, was, it was an emotional day and, and uh, they had something that would really touch me. Uh, they had the Marines come by with a flag and they played Star Spangled Banner and a woman said, Herb, I want you to sit right here. And when they come back, the whole cortege or whatever they're called, there'll be a lady that will come around and when you see her coming, you stand up and salute and she will hand you the flag. And it's a folded, great big flag. And uh, she came by and of course I got to hold my flag and. It wasn't, that wasn't for keeps, but if you see my flag outside, I, I love it and I fly it every day and, and uh, to hold that one was a particular nice day. But, and talking to the people, it's just, uh, it's just heart, heartwarming to talk to some of those people that, that care, you know, they really care. They really care. It's very touching. Um, Herb, what, what was your air base? Uh, I don't think you gave the name of the air base you were stationed at. Anyway. Well, I was in the 301st Bomb Group, 32nd Squadron, out of, Foggia, out of Foggia, Italy. It's right by the spur of the boot. I see. And I think that was that. Was it. And uh, I'll never forget, I flew, my, I flew a brand new airplane overseas, and you talk about a kid with a new, with a new automobile or something. And of course, they weren't going to let Lincoln, Nebraska, the Bangor, Maine, the Gander, Newfoundland, the Azores, the Marrakech, the Tunis, Italy. 7,075 miles in 41 hours. And it took me five days. We were, we were uh, weathered in a lot of places. But uh, uh, it, it's, uh, I'll never forget when I got to the, to the base, uh, the commander said, welcome to the 32nd Squadron, 301st Bomb Group. He said, uh, you're a B-17 pilot, I know you know how to fly that, here's what I expect of you. I expect you to be in briefing on time. I expect you to pay attention because your life depends on it. I expect you, expect you to fly a close formation. What you do out, off base, I don't care, don't get in trouble. And all you have to do, Lieutenant, is take your airplane to Germany 35 times. And if you can bring it back 35 times, you can go home. Dismissed. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> they weren't, that was it. That was it. What were some of the other targets you had besides that one? Uh, oh, well, I got a whole I got a whole list of them. I should have had my no, that's list of them, but uh, uh, Blackhammer Brucks uh, in Czechoslovakia, Northern Italy, uh, Linz, Austria. Uh, there's a whole group. We hear a lot about oil fields. And, oh, that uh, was that was the that was the, the biggest target as, as far as having having getting shot at. Uh -huh. Because that was uh, oil where was, was that oil. at? Well, I think Brooks was that, and I think Regensburg might have been that. And I'm I, I got my sheet here. I got it all down. What what the target was? Mm -hmm. uh, they had airfields, uh, but the oil the oil refineries were the ones that they they wanted to protect. You know. Yeah. Then my last couple missions were over the front lines, where our people were coming up through Italy, and the the Germans were coming down, and and. We, we wanted to stop them, and we had uh, it, it was uh, it was really not much to it. But I got a picture; it's in that book. Uh, we instead of dropping thousand pounders, we carried six one thousand pounders, and you know you multiply that by by seven airplanes in a squadron and four in a group and all the groups. I mean, we dropped. I got a. I, I did it once, and it came up into millions of pounds. Of that's how you win a war. We just mm -hmm. you know. And they were, they were, uh, the Germans were here and we're here. And uh, th these were, these were to protect, uh, protect the, the, the German people and not hurt our people. And it was close. And we dropped what they call frag bombs. It's like a tomato steak and in a big bundle like this. And it's got dynamite on each end and a cap. And when it drops, the, the, the wire goes off and all these things hit all of the thing. And they had red panels out, so we said you, we could not be sure you don't drop until you get. That's where our people were. Germans were here. Don't don't do anything until you cross those red panels. And we also had radio contact with them down there, so we could be sure we don't hit the enemy. So my last couple of missions, they were almost fun, if you want to call it fun, but there was no serious business. And and uh, and of course, you know, I've said it before. And I'll say it again, I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. And that's not to be brave or this. I love my country, I love my flag, and I do it, that's all. It's, me. it's who I am, it's who I am. You know, um, I heard somewhere that uh, you were the best dressed man uh, in I, your <laughs> Class A uniform. How did that come about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, won't, you won't believe it, but you wanna know something? It's the same unit. It's not this one. This is another uniform. But we all, before we got our wings, we had a dress, you know, and so they were for inspection. And we're all dressed, and you know, a bunch of cadets were cadets were going to get our wings. And, and a couple guys looked at me and they said, "Boy, look at your your uniform is really nice." I said, "What are you talking about? It's just like yours. It's here, here, here. No, it's just pretty nice." And my dad was in the tailoring business all his life, and. Uh, what, what he did when he made, he made my uniform and pinned on my wings. And, and I told him this later, he said, well, Herb, he said, what I did actually, he said, it's supposed to be straight across, and I think this one is. He said, I just, I put a little flare in the thing here, and, and, I, and I just took the skirt and I just moved it out a little, a little bit. <laughs> you couldn't tell it, nobody, I didn't know it, it was my own uniform, but that's... Uh, that's what they were talking about. So you had a tailor-made class <laughs> A uniform. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go to flight school at? For uh... well, well, I went to lots of places: Wickenburg, Arizona, and then uh, basic training, and and then advanced in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and then then you decide whether you want fighters or bombers, and that actually that's. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's in uh, the second that's in the second uh, basic basic yeah. yeah and for some reason you know I've got I've got a, a pulp magazine here that it, uh, 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 my stepson got for me G8 and his battle aces 1928 they flew they flew in World War One and I used to read that you know about uh, G8 and, and 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 his two buddies. Uh, uh, and, and, and I thought, oh boy, wouldn't that be something? And for some reason, I don't know what it was. It was a good, it was a good, it was a good thing to do. 
uh, and if you're going to take fighters, you go into a place where they've got fighters in advance, mm -hmm. or bombers, you, you go in to, with a, a twin engine. And I, I took the twin engine instead. And it could have saved my life. Mm -hmm. you know. Not that I couldn't have flown a, a fighter, but there's just something when I saw a picture of that with four engines, I thought, oh, you know, that fighter, you lose one, you got a big problem. That's I'm right. not, you know, plenty blames here, you know. I, <laughs> but I, 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 I did the right thing. I mean, I loved the airplane and, and it served me so well. And, and uh, had a crew of 10, were my, which were my family. That's what they were. And uh, sometimes I think maybe I made a mistake because what happens when you first get there, you're tail end Charlie. Here's, here's, a, here's a squadron here, 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 and tail end. Mm -hmm. So you get to be tail end Charlie again. And if you get moving, you're doing all right. They move you to the second element, see? And then you, 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 you control the second element. And then if you're still doing good, they hit you up here as a, as a, uh, next, to the, next to the leader. And if the leader shot out, you take over. And I had a couple of those where I took over. And then what they wanted me to do, I don't know if I've ever told this to anybody. They liked what I was doing and I was happy about that. And they wanted me to be a constant squadron leader all the time. And uh, I talked to the crew about it. And, and the, the only problem was that we wouldn't fly as much. There were a couple other fellas that had that position. So I'd fly maybe the third time the other two went. And we'd stay there longer. We wouldn't get home longer. It wasn't a question of being shot at different. We'd just stay overseas longer. And I said to the, my, my, my crew, what do you think? And, and they kind of hemmed and hawed. And they said, Herb, you know, you're the airplane commander. We'll, we'll do whatever you want to do. And I knew they wanted to go home. They wanted to go <laughs> home. And I said, OK. So instead of a first lieutenant, I might have been a captain. I could have been a major. But <clears throat> they were my family. And I really, you know, we had we had plenty of combat. I mean, I had <laughs> I had plenty of, plenty of combat. Got shot at plenty, but uh, uh, sometimes I think, well, maybe I should have done that, but I didn't. And here I am, and I'm alive, and and I'm grateful for that. I really am. All my crew are gone, but but they were. They all got home alive, though. Yeah. Well, one of them, I, uh, you know, another thing that happened. We were ready to go overseas and in an in a embarking area, and one of my crew, it was a weekend, didn't show up. And what they did, they took part of my crew from other crews. Somebody needed a radio operator, somebody needed a co-pilot, and they took my crew and they took all the people and put them other places. And I'll never forget my... my uh, radio operator, I got his picture there. And I, I, I remember this uh, fellow that came home late and he came walking down the street and my, my engineer went out there and he hit him so hard, I'm telling you. And, and you know, you can't, <laughs> they don't like you. Fighting's again the rules. It's all right when you get up in the air you don't do it on the ground. Wil Wilmot was his name. And I, I took him in where, to my, my bunk and, put him on there and I said, look, I said, this is the way it happened. I know how you feel. He, he, he loved it. It was, it was, this was our crew. This was us. We cared for each other. And I said, uh, just, it'll be, it'll be okay. I know how you feel. I feel the same way. And I went back through the last, last third part of, of flying the 17. So the, the good part, which I, I, I didn't realize, I had some, I had some more, some more time. I just got a little more time flying that 17 because of that. His name's Wilmot, and I understand that he went, he was sent to England as a as a, a engineer, and he was killed. He was shot down. He was killed. So what had he, what had he done? He, he hadn't done anything. He oh. was so mad at this kid, he oh. he knocked the kid down. Oh, okay. And they then they split up what was left of my crew and gave somebody that needed an engineer, somebody that needed a co-pilot, oh, and they sent him. Evidently, he wound up and he didn't do anything wrong, oh. but but he he was that upset that he knocked that guy down, which of course he shouldn't have done. But but uh, and then he was killed. I understand, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. But I see his picture all the time. It's in there. So. No. So. 
When did you finish all of your missions and uh, get to come home? That was in, uh, I think it's the 16th of April. Of I 1945. Think so. Yeah, that was my last mission. Okay. Yeah. 16th of April, 1945. Yeah, I want to be, I'm positive of that. I right. should know it. And um, so you left Italy and then you came back to the United States? Right. Or? And I went up to Wright Patterson. I don't know if my dad had something to do with that or not. <laughs> See, I, I remember one day when I was up there. And he said, Herb, somebody wants to see you. He said, the, the general of the, <laughs> of the whole ball, I said, what did I do wrong? So he, he did, my dad was talking to him and, and uh, he'd made coats, he'd made uniforms for this fellow. And this guy had ribbons all the way down to here. And I said, I have to tell you, general, that's really impressive. He said, yeah, I just haven't got one of those you got. He pointed my DSC, but. Uh, and I, I, I hit with some, it was, we did some things with 17s and took them out west on different projects and it was fun, it was mm -hmm. fun. But, uh, and I got to check out in other airplanes. I had to know all the bombers. I got to, I got to fly a B-25, which I really liked that, and a B-24, which I didn't like, and B-29, which I did like. But you had a, I'll never forget, I tested the, the engine in the, 25 out at Wright Aeronautic before the war. In yeah, fact, tell I, us about that. Well, if you still, it, if you look on the hub there, it says GR 2600-655. It was a twin row radio, and we they, they were made out at up here, and we put it in a put it on a stand, and then we tested it up in a in a, a room where all the gauges were, and we had a test sheet like this and. The Army had come in and be sure we were, or the Air Corps guy, be sure we were doing things right. But I really, you know, I knew those engines and, and uh, that, was, that, was, that was what I did. You could have very well tested the engines on the Doolittle Raid. <laughs> well, that's what it had. It had, it had yes. that. Yeah. And in fact, would you, you know who I met a couple years ago? His granddaughter, Doolittle's granddaughter. Yeah. She was here in town. She talks all over the world. I don't right. know if you know about she her. Yes, I do. Yeah, she she was really nice. Yeah. I'll never forget what I told her. I said, you know, I said I I know how to fly a B twenty five, and I said I'd have given anything to be on that ship behind your grandpa when he took off. I would. He was some guy, and he you know I, they were all lined up, and and he was in the front, and there wasn't any room between here and the water. Right. And how on earth, I'm sure you know, you put her full, boy, hold, hold the brakes on and full power and then let her go. But even so, he had a, you know, he had a, he had a, it wasn't going to fly right now. Right. But he was, he was a piece of work, I'll tell you, he was something else. So you checked out the engines to make sure that yeah. everything, and then they shipped yeah. them to the yeah. North American? Yeah. And uh, I, for some reason, don't quote me on this, I think. Those engines cost something like seventeen thousand or eighteen thousand dollars, something like that. I don't quote me on it, but yeah. now for God's sake, would they? But it was a, it was a great engine. And you know, I forgot to ask you, where were you on December the seventh, nineteen forty-one? I was down at, at, at a little place, a restaurant down here, when I must have worked at night, and we heard it on the radio that. Uh, were you working at a restaurant yeah. or were you just... No, I, I'm trying, I guess I was up at, I was, uh, I, I had to still be up at uh, Wright, uh, Wright Aeronautical. And uh, then I went back and uh, I think in, it was the summer of, uh, of uh, I guess, 43, that uh, uh, I, I'm trying to think of how, how it was. I stayed up there. And oh, and then I took I took what I, I took my exam down in in uh, Kentucky, and they said you you passed the exam, but she said you can go back to your you can go back to your test cell because the the flight schools are jammed, so I really didn't go until uh, uh, February of uh, uh, 40, 40, uh, 43, and got my wings in forty three. So you were at a restaurant when you heard about yeah, uh, yeah. Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I think I must have done something at night and or had the day off, but I couldn't believe that. Oh boy, oh boy. And then I just, you know, I, when I put my mother through and my dad, I'll tell you, but 
I just, you know, I, I, there wasn't a choice for me. I just had a, my country, I had to go, I had to go. So when did you actually join the military? Uh, or? Well, I think it was in February of 40, uh, 43. I think it was, and I got my wings in December of 43. Okay. And I think that was all cadet stuff. Mm -hmm. I should know it by heart, but I, it's all in a book. Oh. But uh, Do you, um, when you came home in April of 45, mm -hmm. did you have any concerns about being put back into combat? No, I never gave it a thought. You know, I could have stayed in. I've been, no, I meant uh, the, and, at that at that time, did you uh, have any concerns about going back into combat right away? You know, it, it, to the best of my knowledge, it never came up. I mean, I, I probably, that's a good question. Uh, I might have gotten, you know, I, I well, you, you, mature, still, you mature when I There was still a big war going oh, on yeah. in the Pacific. Yeah. You know? Well, I wouldn't have gotten B-20. B-17, so. No, you'd have been in B-29. Yeah. yeah, well, and I flew to 20, I'll never forget my check out in the 20, 29. <laughs> we get up, I've never been to B-29. I'm in a co-pilot seat and we take off and the pilot said, oh, I had a tough night last night. He says, he says, you take over, I'm going by. He said, fly it down to, there's a, a hotel, the Alms Hotel or something, put it on the thing and it's got a tower. I got to take a nap, so I. <laughs> Where were you leaving from? Uh, uh, Wright Patterson. And going yeah. where? Just down, just to, just to fly it. They had to do something. I don't right. know. So I just flew it down the back. And the same thing happened with the 25. When uh, and, and I was anxious to that because I knew the engines. It could have been an engine that I tested. And the fellow said, "Well, he's going to check me out in the 25." And so we go down the runway and he does a pattern. He comes back here, he pulls over on the side and. Stops, puts the brakes on, I, and I said, I thought you were going to check me out. He said, I just saw your, your record uh, in, in the office. Uh, you, you just uh, flew 35 combat missions? Yes, sir. And, and a B-17? Yes, sir. And you, you want to be at the bomber flight test, is that right? I said, yes. He said, if you need more than one ride around the pattern up here, you don't belong here. I'll see you later. So he got out. <laughs> I mean, it's an airplane. I mean, it's <laughs> well, I have another question for yeah. you. Before I forget it, because I'm just engrossed listening to you. Uh, when Paul Tibbetts dropped the atomic bomb on August the 6th of 45, where were you? And when did, and do you recall hearing about it? That was August of 45. Yes, sir. Um, I had to still be. Uh, I had to still be in the uh, August of '45. Oh, oh, I'm still in service. Right. August of '45. I had to be up at Wright Patterson. Right. Uh, I mean, I was glad to hear it. I wish he was around to do it today. Yeah. I got. I have a couple of targets for him. We won't get into that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, it was. Uh, Yes. I guess, you know, I, I guess because of my mother, I wouldn't do it again. Yeah, I don't, I can't say that. I did it once. I knew she wasn't crazy about it. Oh, you, but, uh, what, so, so when did you get discharged then, Herb? Uh, it's on the paper in there. I think in October. On 45? Mm-hmm. I have to really, I got so many, you know. Right. It's, it's. Well, you know, we never, you haven't discussed uh, your love life. What? Your love <laughs> life. <laughs> I don't think we ought to talk about that. <laughs> if you turn the thing off, I'll tell you some stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many children do you have, Herb? I, I, have, uh, I have two, yeah. Uh, a boy and a girl? Or? A boy and a girl. Right. Or, excuse me, I have two boys and, and a girl that from my wife's first marriage, which I really call her my own. Uh -huh. And... Uh, what what are your son's name? Jeff and Doug. Jeff and yeah, Doug. Jeff and Doug. And uh, they're they're great they're great kids. Uh, my son uh, Jeff uh, worked uh, ran a place out in Jackson Hole, a wonderful resort. Mm -hmm. And then he went down to uh, a place down south for a couple of years, 
and a fellow, I can't think of his name, he's a renowned golfer, but he heard about Jeff's background and he bought a piece of ground uh, uh, in, in Jackson that was, had been a golf deal and it wasn't going right. And he heard about Jeff and he got Jeff and boy, he's he got a job now. He's got a great job. They've already took on, I think he got 20 new, 20 new uh, people to join. And what they've done is, there's a lot of people want to play golf out there. There's a lot of golf places. But what do you do if you got children when you want to go play golf? You, 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 you got to stick them someplace or what you do. And the deal that, that and they only, they only have golf, maybe, maybe tennis. But what they're doing, what Jeff's doing, they're not only going to have golf and tennis, they're going to have ski shooting. They're going to have ponies. They're going to have the whole ball of wax. Mm. So you can take all those kids and somebody's got something to do. And boy, I think it's a real winner. And he thinks so too. Yeah. And my other son has just gotten a job with, I don't know all the things he does, but he's thrilled with it. <laughs> the, how about this for something? The fellow that hired him would give him some, when, Jet, when he was looking for a good job, and he'd give him some people that he might go to. But the fellow just hired him. And guess what? Do you think they ever knew each other? They were fraternity brothers at Ohio State, the guy that owns the place that hired him. How about, did they he know, was just, he did was, they know sure he knew. Oh, okay. He, I mean, he, <laughs> he, how do you like that? Yeah. The, the, the boss was a fraternity brother, and, and my son is just going bang. It was just wonderful. So uh, I understand you graduated from Hughes High School, though. You didn't mention that before, but you, didn't you graduate from oh, Hughes? Oh, sure. Yeah. 19... I even can sing, she's the goddess we adore is Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> The only uh, thing I did at school, I don't know, I was on the swimming team and stuff like that. And even college, I'm, I'm not proud of it, but uh, uh, I made the polo team at, at college, and uh, I got an A in English. That was about it. Yeah. Not much to talk about. I wasn't interested. I when did you get married then, when you came home from the service? Uh, oh, I, I was 37 before I married the first time. So that yeah. was 1957 then? Yeah, yeah. I, wow. Uh, had some opportunities, I guess, and uh, we waited a long time. Yeah, but, uh, I'll even show you a picture about one of the I got the picture of. And, and what was your wife's name that you married in 1957? That was Phyllis. Phyllis. Her dad was a, an attorney in in uh, uh, what little town or is it? He was nice. They were nice people. She was a nice lady. Well, your family though was pretty well established here in Cincinnati. Your father worked at Globe Tailoring, didn't he? His whole his life, yeah. Yeah, and your mother was, what was her maiden name? Lowenstein. Lowenstein, and they owned, uh, what was it here in the city? There she is. Want to mm -hmm. see a beauty? Yes, sir. <laughs> she is. She was a beauty. What company did they own here in Cincinnati? Uh, uh, I think it was Globe. No, it was a Globe. Hyman finally bought it. Mm -hmm. I was going to paint Mary Lou on my plane, but... Oh, that brings up a good subject. Did you have a name well, painted the, on your plane? Well, the problem, the problem is that in the early part of the war, these groups would train here as a group and then, and then they'd go overseas as a group. But, and you could paint, you know, anything you wanted on it. Right. By the time I got in there, they didn't have time to fool around like that. As soon as an airplane came off the line, they, my airplane had 15 hours on it. And I got it and I ran the compass and they said, good luck and here's where you're going. <laughs> See, they just didn't have time, they were shooting a lot of them down. Yeah. See, it was, it was tough business in the 8th Air Force from what I heard from guys before. They got fighter escort. Can you imagine? And, and the Germans had their best fighters. Now and you they, were in the 15th. I was you? in the 15th, yeah. yeah. But they said, you know, in in, uh, in England, they didn't have they didn't have fighter escorts in the beginning, and they sent these 17s in there, and boy, those 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 Germans were just licking their chops at them. Did you had much uh, interplay or in, uh, with the Italians while you were stationed at Poggio? Male or female? <laughs> well. 
<laughs> I'll tell you, there was a family, you know, you're, you're the new people in town, you know, and the guys say, you know, old, old timers are there and they say, listen, you want a good spaghetti dinner, you go down here and go through this alley and, and there's a, a, a place there, a woman, a little, uh, their name's Cascavilla, and they got a, they got a, uh, they'll make you some good food. So we go up there and I meet Mama. And, and it, it was very fancy. It was a metal dish with spaghetti on it and black wine, and that was it, red wine. But uh, we got to be, uh, you know, she was, and she had a son, Luigi, Luigi Cascavilla. I don't know what he is. He had a little problem. I don't know what it was, but, but uh, uh, I'll never, well, I can't tell you that story. <laughs> but but uh, anyhow, would you believe, uh, I'll tell you, remind me of that, about, just remember Mama and I'll tell you. Right. But uh, some years ago, uh, my first wife and I went back to, uh, to Italy. And we, we went to, uh, I can't think of all the countries, went to Italy, went to Rome, and I said, We're, we gotta go back to Foggia. I gotta see if there's any left of Foggia. And uh, so we go back to Foggia and we got a, we got a guide because I didn't remember all the streets. And, and I said, uh, there was a, a, a Cascavilla family and, and I told him what I thought the, the uh, street was. And he said, no. Oh, I, I did get him to, to uh, the, the street. And I said, that's a house. And I said, he went upstairs, he said, there's no Cascavillas here, but he said, there is one fellow that lives and they said some building someplace. So I go to this other building and, and my guide goes to find him. And the funny thing about her husband, her husband, her son was, he, 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 walk, he walked with his head on the side like this. I don't know why, but that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're waiting in the vestibule for him to look around this building. All of a sudden I look down the hallway and I see him walking and there's a little fellow with him with his head on the side. And I said to my wife, that's Luigi. Well, I had a mustache because I wanted to look like oh, well, an Italian, I guess, when I... And uh, he walked up to me and he, he did like this to block out the mustache. He says, Alberto! He says, you were pilota. Well, he got carried on. He says, he talked about Esmark and all, and all that. Well, he carried on. I'm telling you, you can't believe it. And they set out a dinner for us, and he had a son and a daughter, 19 and 21. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And we sat there and, and, and ate, and he pet my hand. He'd say, oh, Herberto, he says, oh, nostalgia, oh, nostalgia. And I mean to tell you, it was something oh, to see. Oh, that it had was, to be emotional. It was, it was just from both of us. And what about Mama? Where... Mama's gone, she, Mama was gone. She was gone, yeah. yeah. But, so, uh, well, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, you know. But uh, I love the Italian people were just, uh, they were wonderful. But gee, the poverty. When I turned my airplane in, when I flew overseas, and they and I filled out the papers, and they had a, uh, a table down there with food, and they said, uh, they had men working on the, on the field, digging stuff up and whatever they were doing. They said, look, there's a, get, some, get a metal, uh, 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 kit, a, uh, what, whatever that kit is, what do you call it, a mess kit, and go through the line, and when you get to the end, there's two garbage cans, dump the garbage in one, then there's a hot garbage thing, and dip the water, your thing in that, and put it down, so I, I, oh, I won't keep this, it could be, it could be something from long distance, excuse me. For uh, yeah, it, uh, it, um, so we just finished up, uh, we were just talking about uh, you going back to Italy and meeting oh, yeah. uh, Luigi. Uh, yeah. And uh, that was, and, the, and, and Luigi. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was something. That so, was something. <laughs> so uh, is there anything else you want to add to, uh, to our interview here before we close? Well, I have to say I enjoyed it's good for me, and you guys are great guys. And uh, if you weren't, I wouldn't do this over again like I'm doing. And I, it's okay. I, I really, I mean, you're 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 just nice people, and well, and you 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 do things that I part of my life, very important part of my life. And uh, uh, 
Well, I want to let you know we uh, sincerely appreciate it and we respect and honor what you and yeah. uh, what you did during yeah. the war and yeah. especially your association with John Lear. Yeah, that's and that was a, a yeah. wonderful story to yeah. to put uh, in the archive. Yeah, that's uh, so. he's something. He's something else. He's Herb, something. do you think there's any chance of being able to get an interview with John? I I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. He. Um, uh, where was he? He, he was going to come down to, you know, my airplane was here last week. He was going to come, he didn't come down there. The week before, the year before, about four o'clock in the afternoon, he wasn't there. All of a sudden, I see somebody pushing somebody in a wheelchair, and it's John. It was four o'clock in the afternoon, and he had fallen down. They had to take him to the hospital, and but he knew I was there, and he knew that 17 was there, and he, by God, he was coming out to see me. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of guy he is, you know. I just don't, I can't speak for him, certainly, right. but I, I know the story and I, I just don't think it'll work. Well, we so. want to thank you for this interview and oh. we appreciate it very much. Listen, I hope and I see you guys again sometime. Oh, you that's, shall. That's not you idle shall. talk. I don't do no. idle talk. I really, I haven't got time for it. I never did. And I thank you very I much. Sp then. Speak the truth and I hope that's mm -hmm. yes. what people like.